Good morning, Austin. Today is Austin's first time helping us stream today, so we welcome Austin Bumpus and good luck to you. <laughs> Thank you for everything you do, Austin. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I will now call to order the 268th meeting of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on May 22nd, 2019 at 9.30 a.m. at our offices at 101 Federal Street here in Boston. Before we begin with the matters identified on the agenda, I would like to address an issue of public interest. The Commission was recently notified about exploratory discussions between our two Category 1 gaming licensees, Wynn Resorts and MGM Resorts, regarding the potential transfers of interest. As everyone is also now aware, these discussions have reportedly ceased. To be clear, at no time was there a proposed transaction pending before the Commission. However, like many, we were of course closely monitoring developments. And our focus appropriately remained and continues to remain on the regulatory preparations needed to open Encore Boston Harbor by June 23rd. It is, however, worth noting that the gaming law wisely contemplated the potential for such transfers of interest and provides a specific procedure governing the process. Under the statute, any transfer of interest will always require commission approval, preceded by an extended period of evaluate, evaluation and review, excuse me. Like all matters that come before the commission, and as is required of all of us by law, any such requests would be fairly and objectively reviewed based on all merits and with a strict enforcement of all applicable laws to protect the best interests of the Commonwealth, including our host and surrounding communities. Looking ahead, Boston Harbor is scheduled to open its doors and commence operations shortly. Indeed, the first item up for consideration today is the construction timeline. Despite the many challenges to bring this massive and complex project to fruition, the fact remains that Massachusetts and the city of Everett is home to a nearly complete world-class $2.6 billion development that has dramatically transformed the waterfront, a land that was previously dormant, desolate, and contaminated, which upon issuance of a certificate of operation will soon become a place of employment for 5,000 people. The MGC is fully committed to dedicating all the resources and attention necessary to ensure that the property can open in a timely and orderly fashion and in accordance with what is required by law, just as the MGC has successfully done twice previously. No one ever said, and I'm new here, that the Gaming Commission's job was going to be easy. And on that front, it does not disappoint. But I'd like to thank our staff for consistently monitoring and maintaining focus. The commissioners, and I think I can speak for all of us, are profoundly aware of all the staff, all of our team's dedication and hard work. We thank you for your continued professionalism at all times. And we, um, the eagerness, we thank you for your eagerness, eagerness to rise to every challenge before you. And with that, um, if my fellow commissioners would like to add any comments, I welcome them. Otherwise, we will get to business. Yeah, I, I'd just like to add, um, you know, we have been, <clears throat> excuse me, we have been laser focused on, and our, our licensees know this, all three of them, on making sure all the commitments are met to communities, hosts, surrounding, um, you know, the jobs, all of those commitments, all of those positive impacts of gaming. I mean, that really has always been our focus, and it will continue to be our focus. 
Um, we meet regularly. No matter what talks are going on, we meet regularly with the uh, folks in the community, with police chiefs, with mayors, with other uh, administrators. Um, our staff meets, God, these days probably daily. And um, so that's something we've never forgotten about. We think that's a crucial responsibility for us as a commission to make sure those commitments are met. And, uh, and uh, that has never changed. And that will continue to be the case uh, no matter what else is going on. We're, we're focused on that and making sure um, our licensees meet those commitments. Yeah, uh, that's, that's well said. And uh, I would only um, emphasize something that you uh, also mentioned, uh, uh, Madam Chair, um, that the statute uh, um, contemplated, contemplates uh, the potential for, for these kinds of uh, transactions, what was reported. Uh, and it also lays out a clear process for such a transaction uh, if they come, whenever they come uh, um, before this commission. Um, I think I've, what, I, what I know from um, other jurisdictions, these kinds of transfers do happen from time to time. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm glad that uh, the, the statute here contemplated it. The regulations were further clarified with the great help of our legal team uh, as to how a process like that would take place. Uh, and if it comes before us, we will adhere to those uh, uh, guidelines and regulations in, in the review of, of any kind of, uh, of these transfers. But as you say, well, uh, Commissioner, our, our focus remains the same, uh, remains to, to uh, bring the benefits and try to mitigate the impacts that the casinos bring, and, uh, and that's always been our business. All set. Let's get started. Um, item number two. Approval of minutes. Commissioner Stabbins, please. Sure, Thank Madam you. Chair, as we move on to the exciting step of approval of minutes, <laughs> um, you have in front of you the uh, meeting minutes from the May 1st, 2019 meeting. I would uh, uh, move their approval again, subject to correction for any typographical errors or any other non material matters. I'll second that. Any discussion? Corrections? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd further move that we approve the minutes from the May 6, 2019 uh, meeting. Is, uh, the minutes are included in your packet, and I'd move their approval again, subject to any uh, non-material errors or typographical corrections. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion or edits? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Director Bedrosian is not able to be here today, but um, Councillor Blue, um, do you have any updates on behalf of Director Bedrosian? I do not have any updates on behalf of Executive Director Bedrosian, although I believe he will have updates at the commission meeting tomorrow. And um, Catherine is referencing we do have a full commission meeting tomorrow in Springfield. Thank you. Next item for Ombudsman Ziemba and Mr. Delaney. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. On the agenda today are a couple of items um, that require just a little bit more time to prepare before they're ready for consideration by the Commission. Uh, these items are Encore Boston Harbor Summer of Material Changes Since Design Approval and the Second Amended Encore Boston Harbor Section 61 Findings. After speaking with Executive Director Ed Bedrosian, my recommendation is that the Commission could consider these items next Wednesday before or after our planned agenda setting meeting. Uh, if that timetable meets with the satisfaction of the commission, I will move to the next item. Just to um, remind us that uh, is there one of these items that is um, time sensitive because uh, publication of the uh, uh, in the monitor? That's, that's correct. That would be the Section 61 findings? That's right. So the, 
uh, monitor publication date, we have to meet a May 31st deadline for okay. the monitor publication date and would appear in the June 10th monitor. Okay. But if we have a meeting next Wednesday, as you uh, alluded to, that would still... We can still meet that time. We meet that thing. Okay. Yep. Any further questions for um, Ombudsman's Amber on the rescheduling? That would be the items subpar A and C. Or Th just A, I'm sorry. A and C would be moved to uh, next Wednesday. But only C needs to be published in the monitor. That's correct. So uh, the procedure would be the commission would have its vote. We would file it with the publication, and it would appear on the monitor in early June. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the remaining item, item B, is a vote on a matter that was brought before the commission two weeks ago. As you're aware, we discussed approval of the detailed construction timetable that is required <coughs> under our regulations. That timetable assumes a June 23rd opening date for the Encore Boston Harbor Casino. In order to provide further clarity regarding this date, I am jo uh, joined by Robert DeSalvio, President of Encore Boston Harbor, Jackie Crum, Senior Vice President and General Counsel, and Peter Campo, Director of Construction. In addition to talking about the opening date, they will give a further update on the status of the project. Construction Project Oversight uh, Manager Joe Delaney is also here to answer any questions that the Commission may have. And with that, let me just turn it over to Bob. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the time this morning to do the update. Um, before I get a, a turn this over to Peter to talk about construction, I just wanted to go on the record and affirmative, affirmatively say uh, that with the Commission's approval, we plan on opening on June 23rd at 10 a.m. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Peter Campo. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'll take this the wrong way, but hopefully this is my last update. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pleased to announce that uh, we are 100% on schedule. The entire facility, every space, will be substantially complete by June 10th. And that we intend to file for a certificate of occupancy May 31st and receive it a few days later. Uh, so I think we're in really good shape. All life si safety systems, vertical transportation, everything is just right on schedule. And I don't see any major problems at this point in time to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And then one other thing I'd like to add is that uh, I've been very fortunate to work with a great team of people. Um, both for win, but the construction manager Suffolk's done an outstanding job. The subcontractors, and uh, most importantly, the union workforce has been outstanding. And that the quality is really just out of this world. And not, so, not only are they finish on time, but it's going to look fantastic. And uh, I'm pretty pleased to be able to sit here today and tell you that. So that everyone deserves a tremendous amount of credit. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank, thank you. Peter, can you um, say those dates about, was it the temporary or the permanent certificate of occupancy? We're going to file for a, a permanent uh, certificate of occupancy. I can, there's always a detail. It may, it may turn out that we have a temporary one for a number of days, but our intention is to have everything done and file for a permanent certificate of occupancy uh, May 31st. May 31st. I'm Are trying you? to get Jim Sopa to work the weekend. I should also say the city of Everett has been fantastic to work with. I'm trying to get Jim Silva to work on Saturday. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's on, the, uh, the inspectors should be in really good shape by, by uh, May 31st, and I think it will just be a matter of paperwork at that point. One other comment I'd like to add. It's been actually a pleasure working with Joe through this process. Um, you know, he had the detailed task of actually being on that job site almost all, all the time and working with the construction team and he handled that extremely professionally. And I just wanted to say thank you for that process. <clears throat> thank you. I mean, big picture, I think that's it. Um, it. You'll see, I mean, final pavings next week out front. You'll see that, all the final landscaping's going in. After the 10th, we'll be, uh, after June 10th, we'll be doing punch lists. We expect to have all punch lists complete before the opening. There's always some item, but I think big picture, we're gonna have almost everything done. It's gonna look great. Also, on the, um, the, can you speak a little bit to the outside, um, offside improvements, rather, in terms of schedule? All of the road work is on schedule to be complete. Pavement, 100% done. Landscaping done. Uh, lighting controls done. So the, the last pieces of pavement are being done next week. 
but the, about 89% of it's complete right now. We've got uh, striping to do in Sullivan Square. We're going to do that at night, obviously, work around the traffic. But uh, it's all on, on schedule, and I don't see anything that's going to prevent that. Mm -hmm. And um, there's also, um, have we settled on um, test nights? Uh, I know there's potentially a... Uh, Correct. Uh, June 17th. More than one? Um, June 19th and June 20th are the are the test days. Yep. Usually, um, Mr. Campo, when you come in and talk to us, you there's something that you're worried about or it's keeping you up at night. It doesn't sound like that might that that's the case right now. I wouldn't lie to you. There's quite a few things that I'm worried about, but I think we have them all under control. There's nothing that's a game change it right now we just we've had a lot of work to do over the next 10 days but everything's on track I'm, things come up every day we put fires out every day but I, I think it's I don't see anything that's going to prevent us from hitting the dates I, I just shared with you so okay. would it be that, construction if is that true for our team as well <laughs> that um, we feel like um, we will be prepared as well as uh, the licensee for this opening yeah, I think we're we're on target to get all of our things done. Um, you know, we just had a meeting uh, on Monday with all of the stakeholders regarding all the offsite roadway improvements. We had MassDOT, we had the City of Boston, MBTA, City of Everett, uh, Massport. Uh, you know, and it's, the offsite roadway work will be substantially complete by the end of next week. Uh, we're, we've asked all of those folks for sign-offs uh, for us by June 10th and. All of the heads were shaking in the right direction, so uh, that, that was all good. Um, as far as on-site, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think everything's on schedule there. Will some of the things be pushing right up to the very end, more than likely? Um, but I think we feel pretty comfortable that we're going to make the finish line. In the last meeting uh, here with the Encore folks, we had a public safety report that's critical to a successful opening how well we manage traffic, incidents that may occur. Um, they gave us a positive report. It looked like it was well planned. Is that still on track? All of those plans that we heard about? Yeah, I think um, commissioners will have an, a further update regarding all the opening preparations at the beginning of June, either the June 6th or the June 13th meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll give you the, the final detail on all of those opening preparations. But uh, they continue and they're moving absolutely in the right direction. and. Um, I think everybody's paying attention to the challenge that's before us. So it sounds like we will have a meeting next week uh, to look at the two items um, that we just talked about, Section 61 findings. Um, and uh, what was the other one? The design changes. Oh, design, design changes, that's right. Um, we'll have, you mentioned a meeting on June 6th and then June 13th as well? June 13th is what we're planning right now for the, uh, basically that would be the date where all of the directors uh, give their reports to the commission That's right. That's on right. the status of all the items, responsible gaming, uh, preparations, construction, workforce development, internal controls, workforce development, uh, regional tourism, a number of other items. Right, right. I just had a quick question, if I can, from you, Peter, go back to Sullivan Square on the construction schedule we have that work is looking to be completed six days before opening I heard you talk about painting is that really all the work that's got left to be done uh, prior to that package number four being completed that's it I don't think there's anything else nope not the world there was some landscaping that's almost done they're, they're okay. cleaning that out it's almost done right now but the heavy stuff is done basically absolutely yeah we're Everything looking through, so looking at, at, at May 31st of being at substantial completion now will there be some punch list items sure um, that will go beyond that but really substantial completion is you know it's all paved now the traffic signals are up and operating um, they're they're real close we just hear a lot about Sullivan Square. Understood. That's the one that's closest to the opening date. That's what and sure. the good news is well, the weather so. seems to be shifting to cooperate with right. some yes. lining. We certainly thank appreciate you. that. So thank you. Yes. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Um, um, I, I know you started with these remarks, Bob, but um, in the last uh, earnings call, um, 
CEO Matt Maddox mentioned the possibility of opening a, a, a week or two later. Is that, uh, we take it, uh, no longer the case? That is no longer the case. We're, we'll be ready to go on June 23rd at 10 a.m. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Uh, if there are no other, other questions, uh, we recommend that the Commission approve the timetable as specified in the packet. Uh, included in the packet is a description that um, nothing in the approval of this Encore Boston Harbor schedule shall be construed to otherwise impact or impair the Commission's Section 61 findings issued in relation to the Encore Boston Harbor project. As we discussed, those would be up for consideration at a future meeting, but I think it would be sufficient uh, for the Commission to move that they would approve the construction uh, schedule as detailed in the memorandum included in the packet. We have a motion. So, um, any further questions for Ombudsman Zanza? Madam Chair, um, I move that we approve the construction schedule pursuant to 205 CMR 135.022A um, based on the information uh, provided in the memo. Do I have a second? Second that. All those, uh, any further discussion or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. And I also wish to thank um, both you, John, and Joe for your thorough work and the benefit of the thorough um, briefings that we do get in the course of our daily operations. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That concludes my report. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good. Madam Chair, Commissioners, Good I'm uh, before you again today on uh, the boundaries of the gaming establishment. What you have in your packet is uh, has a small revision from the last one you reviewed. It now includes the loading dock area that the previous one uh, had omitted. And that's the only change from what you, you right. saw at the last and, meeting. And I do want to introduce you. Um, <laughs> so this is um, Assistant Director, Gaming Agents Division, Chief. Yes. Bruce Band and who has um, been very helpful on the matters that he will now move forward. So in terms of we're now five, yes. um, sub, uh, part A with respect to the gaming establishment boundary and please. Yes, now. I say the, the, the uh, uh, print that you have before you, the only change from the last meeting that, that we discussed this was the inclusion of the loading dock area which includes the uh, armored car bay and a lot of the liquor storage and so on. And just to be clear, that's on the right side of the map. Yes. Right, so. Any questions and that's about a, that? So it's the same sketch with the inclusion of just the. Yes. Um, the loading. Any <laughs> questions or anything regarding that? Oh. Well, um, Director Ban, there was some discussion last time about some of the boundaries yes and we heard some uh, testimony regarding uh, landscaping heavy landscaping can you just provide your rationale for um, inclusion of all of the properties as are outlined here? Uh, for, from my standpoint I, I thought it would be easier for my staff but actually seeing this physically that all the area that's not included is a landscaped area so with bushes trees and everything else so what they have there makes sense for the property Okay, so this uh, this outline sketch with the red, uh, the delineations in red, that is the proposed gaming establishment, and it does exclude some landscaped areas. Yes. Because it just didn't make sense. It's so heavily landscaped, it's... You would have a difficult time being in that area. <laughs> yes. Okay. So you've, you've discussed that, and you're, you're confident this is the way we, we should move forward. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think I've received a little bit of clarification, Bob, maybe you can address this too, because I know I raised it um, um, earlier. At the, where the um, harbor walk 
intersects at the end of your garden area. Correct. We had talked about that there wasn't really a boundary of landscaping separating the public harbor walk and the um, the garden. The pavilion at the end. And I and um, I learned this uh, to be clear because we have had the benefit of a tour, which really helped put the on our, mm -hmm. appropriately on our two by twos by uh, two by one. Um, we uh, took the tour and I saw the open area and I think there's been further clarification. So There has been. Um, what I learned even after the tour is there is some landscaping that will delineate all areas except the pathway on both sides where the intersection point is. Right, so right at that end where the harbor, yeah. near the gazebo, right. Correct, so you see how the path, it's a <laughs> circular path that wraps and what we did was just leave open the two portions where the intersection point is. Okay, and so there will be further. Yeah, so it, it actually will give a little bit more of a delineation. Thank you. Thanks sure. For that clarification. So that would be the only other change that. And it doesn't affect, though, it won't affect the actual diagram, but, um, but the landscaping is there, the new plan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? So, Bruce, you are seeking a vote today. Do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move the commission to approve the boundaries of the gaming dis establishment as described in the drawing included in the May 22, 2019 commission packet. Second. Any further discussion, questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Curtis, morning. how are you? Good morning. Is your mic? Bill, is your mic on? I do that all right. the time. And again, this is Bill <coughs> Curtis, the uh, licensing manager. Thank you. Okay, the first item I have here, consideration or approval, are two positions for the Dunkin' Donuts that will be operated at on Cove Austin Harbor. We're seeking exemptions for two positions, the expert centralized crew trainer as well as crew members. There'll be two positions that at this time won't be exempt, and that's the manager as well as the assistant manager. There was a little bit of confusion in the exemption request. The back of the house um, question, it was answered yes, and then it was answered no. I spoke with my contact for Dunkin' Donuts, and she was just trying to be very honest, saying that their employees will be coming in from the employee entrance, and she wasn't sure if that was back of house or not. But all their storage will be enclosed in their facility. So they won't really have any reason to go to the back of the house, only the employee entrance. Do we need to correct that? I'll have that corrected. Okay, excellent, thank you. That's a, that's a very helpful clarifier. Um, Bill, so you were, um, I, I see in the packet there's other exemptions uh, requested. Are you going to go them by by vendor? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. So you just did the first. One. This was to be the um, it would be Dunkin' Donuts. This is the Dunkin' Donuts. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Bill, if we can just if they if we're going to be kind of editing the applications they gave us, mm -hmm. you know, they put down uh, Encore Boston Harbor as the licensee. Can we just? Yeah, we have to. Out? I think we need to do a little bit of. Um, rearranging with this we keep it as the licensee and then also the vendor okay. probably be helpful underneath okay. do you think that's okay i think that's perfect it was it would distinguish it a little bit easier confusing to look at it the first correct. time i wasn't sure who they were working for but it makes sense correct councillor blue are, are you comfortable with those changes being made um, by Mr. Curtis, um, if we vote on it substantively, would you be able yes, to I'm review that? Yes, I'm comfortable with that. Okay, thank you. And uh, 
Mr. Curtis, this was the same analysis that you've conducted in the past to recommend to us that uh, this position is consistent with other positions that we have uh, exempted? Yes, Commissioner Cameron, yes. We did the same thing at, at um, Starbucks at MGM, mm -hmm. as well as um, Dunkin' Donuts at Plain Ridge Park Casino. Would you like us to vote on this yes, as a package yes. or on these on the document? Um, just on this one right here, okay. and then we'll discuss big night items. That makes sense. Do I have a motion? Uh, sure. I'll um, I'll move that the commission exempt um, from licensure the two um, positions described in the package from um, vendor Dunkin' Donuts. Second. Second. Uh, um, is there any further discussion? Just for purposes of clarification, the two positions are the expert centralized crew trainer and then crew member. Yes. I don't think we need to amend the um, uh, motion. Motion, no. Um, as presented in the, in the uh, package. All, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? 5 0. Thank you. You want to continue? Joined by Christine Rohn from Big Night Entertainment. Could you just say that a little bit louder, um, okay. Mr. Curtis, please? I said I'm joined by Christine Rohn from uh, Big Night Entertainment Group. Hi, Commission. My name is Christine Rohn. I'm the Vice President for Big Night Entertainment Group. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. Okay, before you, you will find um, a memo as well as um, 16 positions that we're seeking consideration or approval to be considered to be exempt from registration. A big night entertainment group. Um, these folks will be working at Mystique and Memoir. There'll be two um, facilities, outlets that will be at Encore Boston Harbor, and they'll be operated by Big Night Entertainment Group. Um, the positions that we're seeking to exempt are, I'm going to say, back of the house. It's not the typical back of the house as we look at it as a casino, but back of the house of the restaurant. It'll be the cooks, um, dishwashers, um, chefs, assistant chefs, food servers, and the position in the front of the house will be the host person. Um, these positions all align with um, exemptions that have been approved for Encore Boston Harbor for their restaurants as well as MGM. But there are, in the memo you see, there are 25 positions that we're not putting forward for consideration as exempt as exempt positions. These positions are pretty much the front of the house. They're also um, they have active duties with um, alcohol, and that's one of the parameters that you, as a commission, set, set that these positions should not be exempt. So, Bill, we have a. Um just a quick question, as you, as you talked about alcohol service, obviously you have food servers identified for both Mystique and Memoir, um, and I understand you're recommending that they be exempt, um, but is there any information you can give us as to training that you put food servers through in terms of, you know, did they do safe serve, safe serve? Um, in any other type of alcohol training before they go out on the floor? They do. All of, we do have in-house um, serve safe uh, tips is what we use, uh, trainer, and all of our, uh, actually there's a lot of positions, but food servers is one of the positions that's required to uh, take that class before uh, going on the floor. Thank you. Uh, Bill, I know you mentioned there's a parallel to something we've accepted. Uh, uh, positions that we've accepted in the past, notably at MGM, but um, uh, is there a vendor this size uh, with MGM? I, I, I don't no, think that's No, no, MGM case, operates right? all their own facilities. Right. This is the first time we've ever dealt with, um, just to jump a little ahead, it's like a joint responsible party. Right. So we've never had a vendor like this. Um, even at Plain Ridge Park, they're all franchisees and they're operated by Plain Ridge Park. Right. 
So it's a, a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But you feel confident that the folks exempted do not pose any risk that we have not anticipated because it's a little bit different? There's nothing there that gives you pause? In, in my opinion, no, not at all. I feel very comfortable with these positions. I also feel very comfortable in the positions that we're acquiring folks to register so we can do a little background and feel a little bit safer with, with what they'll be doing and how they're going to interact with the folks that are coming to their establishment. Right. Um, and, and you feel uh, confident that everyone in this joint venture understands their responsibilities with regard to um, what we're looking for as a regulator? Absolutely. I mean, we've had detailed discussions on um, the positions that we d did put um, up for consideration to be exempt. Um, we went back and forth on quite a few of the positions, but at the end of the day, we did come to an agreement, okay. and they understood they understood where, where I was coming from. Great. Did you want to speak to that? I, I do agree. Um, we took Bill's guidance um, in all of the positions um, in, his, in his expertise and recommendation um, and agree fully. Okay. Great. Bill, the other question I had was both uh, Memoir and Mystique have receiver positions, and as it's described, they're going to be going to the loading dock for transportation and receipt of alcohol. So we've just added the loading dock to the footprint of the gaming establishment. Does that change any of your recommendations? Are they going to be assisted by security as they go back to the loading dock area? Um, I'm assuming they will be. Um, they'll have to have security um, with them to go and get them. Um, if not, I'll clarify that with, with Big Night and Sam Group, make that suggestion. But again, they're not really serving. They're just coming to take the box from the delivery and then bring it to their establishment. Um, so it's nothing more than just picking up a box of, of alcohol. They're not going to go anywhere. Um, and if they do have a, they will have a security escort. Um, and then they just bring it right to either Memoir or Mystique. And we've exempted that position already. Yeah. Um, yes. But that's their internal view. Correct. Okay. I would just recommend, I don't think I have a problem exempting it, but let's look to process as to how the person gets back to the loading dock area. Okay. I'll get that from them. Any follow-up questions? I'm just checking one thing. So the receiver is at the end first. I was just clarifying that with respect to the receiver position, in, um, we have in the past exempt that same position. Mm -hmm. Correct. So uh, it's my understanding that you've applied the same standards here for these positions that we um, applied in the past. Yes, ma'am. And you don't you don't perceive any additional risk to in this case. No, but Ms. Rohn, she can um, explain a little bit further about what their position entails helpful. and how they, they deliver the alcohol. Thank you. Uh, the receiver is responsible for both food and alcohol uh, mixed deliveries. They do not do any of the unpacking or um, storage of any of the um, alcohol. It is strictly a transport to our each of our venues. Okay. Thank you very much. Do we have any further dis uh, questions? Mr. Curtis, is that so? Would you like a motion? Sure. So, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the service employee exemption requested in the memo from uh, Mr. Curtis, the licensing manager, included in the May uh, 22, 2009 um, packet for Big Night Entertainment Group, and their exceptions include. Uh, chef, executive chef, chef uh, executive sous chef, assistant chef, lead kitchen worker, cook kitchen worker, porter assistant, 
chef, pastry, food server, host person, bus person, food runner, receiver, kitchen worker, porter, food server, host person, and receiver. Do we have a second? Second. All those for the discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. You need to get the group? Okay. He needs, a, he needs two minutes. We get the group. So we just take a short break. Okay. Um, I've been asked if we could just have a short break. We just need a few minutes for setup. So uh, we will reconvene in, in 10 minutes at, uh, we'll do 10.30. Thank you. So we're reconvening. Uh, good morning again. Licensing Manager Curtis and Assistant Director Band. The request for an is for an alcohol permit, which was, uh, uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Awesome. Violating the rules. We'll get back to make sure we're on. Usually, Janice must retreat is my cue. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Austin. We'll start again. We're reconvening uh, today's meeting, um, <clears throat> number 268. Again, Licensing Manager Curtis, Assistant Director Ban, and the request is for an alcohol permit, which was also, as we know, put out for public comment. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Commissioners, good morning. Good morning. Um, I sit here with Bruce Ban, and we are presenting you with the application for Windmass LLC DBA Encore Boston Harbor for a gaming beverage license. A version of this application was presented to you on May 6th. Um, and then it was put out for public comment. Since that time, it has been determined that the application contains all the elements required in accordance with 205 CMR 13404 with the exception of the registration application from jointly responsible parties. In addition, the Commission has received public comments regarding Encore Boston Harbor's request to serve alcoholic beverages until 4 a.m. on the gaming floor. The application contains requests for 23 licensed alcohol outlets. There'll be 15 outlets on the ground floor, including the Harbor Walk concessions. On the second floor, there will be five, including the in-room dining, and then there will be three on the third floor. Amongst the 23 gaming um, licenses, um, excuse me, alcohol beverage licenses, there will be three that will be operated by jointly responsible parties. We do have the owners of the respons jointly responsible parties sitting in the second row right here, so they'll be available for questions as well. Good. At this time, myself and Assistant Director Band will not make a recommendation on the application. So if we could, we'd appreciate it if Ms. Crum from um, Windmass LLC could make the presentation. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I know we've, we've been before you with this application. Uh, I'm happy to walk you through it again, um, or I'm available, obviously, to answer any questions that you have. Just wanted to highlight a couple of the changes that we've made since the last time you've seen this application. Uh, in particular, we were asked to clarify that ex with the exception of Memoir, which is the nightclub, um, the bottle service would be for private, u private parties only in all the other uh, restaurants. Uh, the other change that we made was with respect to the, uh, the service in the salon and the spa areas. Um, we have limited that service to supervisor positions only. So those were the two changes, and um, I can walk you through the application again. Or? 
Could you please provide the highlights of, um, of you know, the locations and the times that they will be ending with alcohol service and the, um, the limited times and, and location for what you're requesting, which is the two to four. Could you just give us those sure. highlights, please? So we have requested uh, the service of alcohol throughout the entire building until 2 a.m. Uh, not that every outlet would necessarily be open until 2 a.m. In fact, most of them will not. Um, however, okay. however um, with respect to the gaming floor only, for those patrons who are actively involved in gaming, we have requested an extension of that from 2 to 4 a.m. Uh, these are complimentary beverages that patrons receive. And just to take a step back, one of the things that we were looking at is whether our procedures and policies and the obligations of our employees with respect to the service of alcohol don't change whether they're serving a drink at 8 a.m., 4 p.m., midnight, or 3 a.m. They are, they are all trained. They are all, uh, they're all responsible for making sure that they are responsibly serving all of our patrons. Um, there was a question about how would we notice that, uh, that uh, our patrons are actively gaming. How do we limit that? Uh, no different to the service of patrons at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, there is constant vigilance uh, with respect to that. There's also a, um, a restriction in terms of how many drinks that patron can get within an hour, and that's all done through uh, managing their rotations. I also have with me uh, our executive director of food and beverage, Warren Richards, and he's got a lot more information about those details uh, in terms of the training as well as the service. Um, yes, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, so the qualification for complimentary beverage is definitely something that we're, we're going to be emphasizing from the beginning. Our goal is to establish that not through a first look at a guest, um, especially in the slot sections, which is the hardest to, to gauge F of whether someone is actively gaming. Much easier in table games and craps if someone has you know, a hand in, literally cards in their hand, um, or you know dice and essentially involved in the game with slots we understand there's there is a uh, an establishment of the fact that they're involved in gaming so um, as the uh, servers are walking through the sections they're essentially making a note that that person is in the process they're then going to revisit that section with the goal being within the first 20 minutes of them playing they would receive their first beverage it is not a case of turning the corner and seeing someone in a gaming position and then assuming that they've actively been playing. So we are looking to establish uh, through visual uh, and also making repeated visits to the same area to make sure that person has been there, they have been actively playing for a period of time um, before we engage them for the uh, service of beverage. And from a guest service perspective, it's very easy for our service to essentially acknowledge their presence, tell them they'll be back with them shortly, and then on the second visit, if they're still there and still exhibiting a pattern of, of gaming, that's when then we would then engage them. The structure of the rotations and the uh, size of the gaming floor and the staffing levels are paced correctly so that a, a, a guest would not receive service more than three times per hour. And that is our goal is to, it is a service, so we do want them to receive beverage, um, but we're looking to pace at about three drinks per hour. And we've also made adjustments to the pour size and other things to be less, so our standard pour is actually less than one ounce for those beverages, again, to pace them accordingly through their uh, time gaming with us. Could you speak to me about, um, I know that they received training to identify individuals who may be intoxicated, who may have had too much to drink, mm -hmm. but I think your facility is very different than, um, say, a, an establishment in any city in this state, meaning um, maybe they were at one location beforehand and you're, you're trained to maybe identify walking in um, uh, what their level of intoxication may be. But your facility, as you just outlined, has so within one facility so many different um, restaurants, bars in which they can be served. How are you training your, your people so that they can really detect someone who may have been at four different, five different establishments, but they're new to um, the one in which they, they are asking to be served. 
So um, the TIPS training and the mm -hmm. certified TIPS training mm -hmm. is the basis of all of our service um, parameters for this area. And that is, again, from our perspective, no different to a guest walking up to a bar um, in the middle of the afternoon. So, um, you know, if, if a guest is exhibiting those clear visual um, signals, then we hit a moment of pause. And we have a management structure and the ability for that team to always defer to someone for a second opinion. And again, there is verbiage that we're going to teach them to essentially put a guest on ice, to revisit them, to uh, bring over someone else for a second opinion, whether that's someone on the cocktail services management team, or if necessary, a second opinion from someone in our security team, uh, of which the presence is very, very strong on, on our casino area especially. So, um, you know, we, we teach our team to take personal responsibility for the decisions they make on the casino floor. And every single time, not just there, in all of our restaurants, if they are going to engage in that transaction, they have to have confidence that the person uh, on the other end of that transaction, the guest, is in a state to receive that alcoholic beverage. Now, nonverbal signals, the speech that someone has, the uh, manner in which they're moving, these are all signals that we're always keying into. And again, we are um, looking to provide a service, so we do have the ability to switch someone into a non-alcoholic beverage, which is one of our most common go-tos when it comes to uh, a guest that maybe we're not sure about, is seeing whether they would be okay having a non-alcoholic beverage. Typically, we know if there's an aggressive reaction to that, maybe we did make the right call. Um, if it's someone that is being very reasonable with us, they'll typically accept a cup of coffee or something different and that allows us to confirm whether or not they were, uh, should have received service in the first place. And just to follow up on a point that Warren touched on, this building has eyes on it like no place else. Uh, you know, our security team is also trained in this. Uh, we've got 230 people, individuals who are on our security team. As you know, we obviously have um, the gaming enforcement unit. There's 19 uh, members of that, plus 10 gaming agents. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and that, that doesn't even take into account the surveillance that's happening as well. All of those individuals will be trained to identify the signs of intoxication um, and will be trained in how to, our, our first goal is obviously to de-escalate, um, but if it needs to be escalated, uh, of course we, we follow up with the appropriate authorities. Um, Bruce, uh, we, we approved the, uh, these um, piece for MGM um, a few months ago, and now we have at least some track record of, um, of what is happening on the ground. One of the concerns um, from, from people who, who comment is uh, the notion that there might exist this uh, rush, if you will, uh, after um, neighboring uh, bars or restaurants close and the only available um, operation is, uh, is, is, uh, is the casino that can serve additional hours. Can you speak a little bit about that? Uh, we, have, we have not seen that at MGM. Uh, I, I just don't think people make, make the, the trip at two to go somewhere else and park and, you know, then engage in game. So you think they, uh, individuals who may have thought this was a way to continue drinking now realize they have to be actively gaming and that... I, um, I think that's been the misconception all along. People always leave out that actively gaming part. So if they run to the, the place and ask for a drink, they won't get it if they're, they're not seated at a table or playing a slot machine or at least one of our comments also suggested that there might be a misunderstanding about the cost of these drinks that between two and four, and they are complimentary. They are complimentary. Okay. I say complimentary. You need to be uh, actively gaming. So. Actively gaming. So there are two <laughs> conditions to clarify. It must be actively gaming. I um, understand that this is a practice that's generally accepted throughout your industry. Is that, is that fair to say? Absolutely. So, um, you know, in Nevada, it's 24-hour uh, liquor service available. Uh, it's something that our customers expect and anticipate. 
the other uh, consideration that we have is we're, we're hopefully going to have a lot of international visitation. So we're trying to um, adjust to the different time zones as well. And we will uh, be briefed on a regular basis as to any concerns that arise, uh, at least with respect to the quarterly report. Mm -hmm. That's correct. I'd like to just go back to the, uh, the spa and the salon. I understand that now s that supervisors only will have access to the alcohol? That's correct. It'll be locked up and uh, if a guest requests uh, alcohol service or if it's offered to a guest, uh, the supervisor will be responsible for both um, retrieving the alcohol and serving the alcohol. Um, Jackie, you spoke to this briefly, but um, uh, there's other comments relative to the um, to the following concern that um, if there's all these operations that close at the same time, you know, the same restaurants, let's say, or or, or nightclubs, uh, that there would be a release right. a, a release of a lot they, of people. They, they don't actually close all at the same time. A lot That's what I wanted are. to. Yes. Yeah. So while there's there's different hours, and we put in the uh, PowerPoint presentation the um, anticipated hours of service. And so, for instance, uh, Mystique would stay open far later than um, some of our other places. Fratelli's would uh, be another venue that uh, plans to operate on an extended hours. So um, th it, there won't be a close of all restaurants at 10 p.m. where everyone makes their way onto the gaming floor, and that, that's going to be much more staggered. Mm -hmm. I, I would follow up as a question, though. One, one of the big concerns for me is you have a nightclub with the capacity of up to 600 people that does, I'm assuming, close it too. So now you have 600 people kind of coming out. Going out actively to game. <laughs> Hopefully going out actively to game, but you know, that's, that's my, my big concern about, you know, that 600 that have obviously been dancing and having a good time now coming out onto the floor. Um, so keep that in mind as I talk about the next question, which is based on, and it's here in the presentation, that maybe it's <coughs> reflected differently in the application, but on the center bar, uh, alcohol dispensing area beverages will be distributed by bartenders at the counter for cash paying guests or actively gaming guests. Is that up till two o'clock people can buy a drink? So up what do you until do two, between 2 and 4? Up until 2 a.m., people would be able to buy a drink, on much like any other bar. Uh, at, we do have gaming stations at that center bar. Right. So when they, when they talk about uh, you know, giving actively gaming uh, customers, those would be the customers that are actually sitting at that bar right. and involved in active gaming. OK. Yes, so, um, so between 2 and 4, um, essentially the bar shuts down as a cash bar and we or as a bar in general and we actually if you could imagine putting a wall up there we essentially treat it like a slot section so it's actually visited by servers from behind the bar as if that was a straight uh, blank wall with slot machines against it so they actually come from behind the guest and would offer them beverage and that comes from the casino service bars so at two o'clock we make that clear delineation now there may still be someone behind that bar cleaning and doing other things but the actual alcohol service no longer happens from behind the bar. It actually happens from the cocktail servers that are on the casino floor. Okay. On the, the uh, page 18 of the presentation, and maybe this is just a clarification or I'm not reading it right, the last bullet, you say between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., actively gaming guests will be provided complimentary beverage service from the cocktail service staff to the casino service bar. That's Maybe this is what you're alluding to. The center bar will not provide alcohol. If it, just right. So it's a little confusing, but until you give me that explanation, yeah. It, yeah. it's a little more clear. You you have two um, uh, two facilities that shut down that essentially have no front door. Um, on That's deck right. In the oyster bar, on deck is located near the smoking patio, so you like all likelihood will have some from security there, how do you how do you cover that long stretch of hallway where 
the oyster bar is in making sure that people aren't just wandering into well, essentially an open venue? So we have looked at the uh, spaces where we do not have a, a locked door to protect, and we've um, actually positioned security offices at those at those uh, places okay. to prevent uh, entry. Okay. Um, the only other the only other thought, or in, I share this with our our crack team that will be on site during the uh, during the test nights. And again, I appreciate the test nights from my experience being held well in advance of your official opening because it does give you a chance to work out some of the kinks. But uh, I'll be very mindful of hearing about lockup procedures. You have a lot of establishments are going to be going through the lockdown procedures. Again, based on our experience, that needs to become a little bit more routine. But um, you know, I'll be looking to our team to see how well that's executed, and we have the benefit of three test nights to make sure it gets done right. So, thank you, uh, Commissioner Stebbins. I just wanted to answer one question you'd raised about people coming out of the nightclub. One of the things that we thought about was to make sure that there's some food restaurants open to mm -hmm. facilitate um, that sort of transitional period, get people out and into a restaurant to eat something as well. Remind me how many restaurants are open beyond uh, normal dinner times? So um, in the post 2 a.m. period, um, yep. especially on the weekends, which is obviously the most important time, the Red 8 restaurant will be staying open late. Mm -hmm. um, Fratelli will be opening uh, late. And uh, also on nightclub nights, we intend to open the sports bar on deck, which is directly opposite, until late. So again, you're taking that guest and you're uh, tempting them with food. Um, and hoping that you know they, they move into one of those venues late. Mm -hmm. The uh, two cafes on property as well also stay open uh, 24 hours. That's both Dunkin' Donuts and our own, which is called Brew. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other concerns that was raised both when MGM asked and then in the comments to your request for two to four also was the impact possibly on increased OUIs operating under the influence given the extension of alcohol service. Can you speak to in addition to identifying who's gaming and their state of sobriety, whether you're going to serve them, what you're doing, if at all, in general, but in particular two to four, if someone shouldn't be going out where there's no public transportation available. Right. So again, I, I'd say that's one of those issues that, that is impacted no matter what the time is. So if somebody's trying to, if they go to the valet to retrieve their vehicle and they're showing signs of impairment, the valet will not provide them their keys. Um, we'll have officers monitoring people who are entering the parking garage to see visible signs of intoxication. Uh, we've also had extensive conversations with the city of Everett and the uh, police chief. Um, and they are increasing their, um, their police force. Uh, th they know that, that this is a consideration and they're going to be closely monitoring that. I, I would say the distinction though is there is a peak time here with no public transportation available where earlier in the evening there is. Do you have anything planned if you have somebody in terms of relationships with you know, Uber, Lyft, cabs, anything like that Absolutely. to get someone safely home? Um, Commissioner, I'd like to address that one because I've experienced this um, at other casino operations. I make sure that our staff 100% knows that if they have any question about a customer and their ability to operate a motor vehicle, they have the full authority to provide them a ride home. I will not ask a single question about it other than that somebody um, thought that it might be a good idea because they weren't sure if somebody should be operating a motor vehicle and we give them the full authority if need be to get a lift, an Uber, a bus, a car service or whatever. Um, we, do, we would do it any time and we have their back on that. And we also train the employees so that they're told, for instance, make sure the person has a friend who's sober before you just let them leave. Let's try to make sure they've got a friend or they've called a family member or they've called an Uber. So all of our employees are trained to make sure that they, it, it's not just identifying someone and walking them to the door, that they've actually got a safe passage home. And then in terms of um, members of IEB and anyone in state police who might have experience with MGM and the two to four there, I know it's relatively new, but if there's anything that you would want to comment on in terms of differences in how GEU or security acts, you know, as a result of the two to four, I'd be happy to hear it. From Mark? We're going to, uh, we have a comment. One Brian moment, Connors. please. Detective Lieutenant Connors is going to speak to this.
Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, specifically regarding the, the, the two to four service and our experience at MGM, um, as Director Band had mentioned, uh, the short answer is we haven't had a, a significant period of issues uh, with that service. Uh, that being said, the that night shift is a, is our busiest shift. Uh, it certainly does lengthen the night for people. Uh, so there are people on site probably later due to that two to four, but I wouldn't directly attribute uh, any of the issues that we're dealing with on a consistent basis with that two to four alcohol service. It's something that we closely monitor the gaming enforcement unit uh, of the state police uh, with the Springfield police, as well as uh, uh, direct the bands team with the gaming agents and in the surveillance and security uh, group. We do monitor those late night activities very extensively. We're proactive. Um, and again, just in summary, we haven't had a continuous issue with uh, that two to four service to the point where we think that we would need to readdress this uh, before the commission. Um, Detective Lieutenant Connors, did you um, identify your team, identify individuals who may have thought they could come and just extend their evening, not realizing they have to be actively gaming? Is that something you kind of, or did that not occur at all. People understood um, what the rules were. No, I, I believe there was a learning period, a learning curve for the public in general. Uh, we were seeing, you know, increased crowds coming in, but I think you know, word got out pretty quickly that you have to be actively gaming. A challenge is then for the staff to be uh, actively monitoring people who are gaming and who are just there as hangarounds trying to get additional drinks. We have seen instances where people that are not actively gaming, they may be watching a game, attempting to get drinks and things like that, and um, sure, certainly there have been issues of that, um, instances of that, but not to the point where I think it's, a, it's a, an ongoing problem. So, so I think there has been a learning curve for the, for the public in general. I think since opening we've had three incidents that we observed where maybe somebody got served that wasn't actively gaming, but that was instantly dealt with, with by the MGM uh, executive staff. And, and we just heard um, the team from Encore talk about their policy with uh, providing rides. I know that your team has done something similar, right? Make sure to uh, not allow people to get behind the wheel. Absolutely, and we, we aggressively monitor that. And we do put it on, we do hold the licensees accountable for options for us when we deal, have to deal with somebody to get them safely off property, to get them safely home, um, and that they also bear some of that responsibility and burden to facilitate that uh, with us. So when we come in contact with these people that have been gaming or have been uh, at the facility uh, that we we do have options to get them safely home. And those options, uh, um, maybe uh, Bob alluded to them, but um, the providing means complementary? Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Not just offering uh, as an alternative. Thank you. Uh, quick question back to Jackie. Can you guys just walk through um, how you shut off service before 4 o'clock, how you sweep the floor, kind of what's the process you normally do before 2, but tell me how it Yeah, so it's essentially um, a last call, just a traditional last call around 3.30. Um, obviously, it's a very large gaming area, so um, that's the goal is 3.30, the process begins. We give everyone that last opportunity uh, to have one last beverage. We've already communicated from around 3 o'clock a.m., that there is a last call coming. So we're already kind of setting expectations with the guests during that two to four period um, that this is not going to keep going forever. There will be an end to service. And when that moment comes, it is around 3.30, that's when we would try and execute that last round of drinks. Uh, again, that is a process. It is a large building, so we do have all of the folks <coughs> going back to the service bars, retrieving that round of beverage, dropping it off with the guest that is actively gaming, and then one more time verbally confirming with them that the end of beverage service has essentially happened at that point when they receive that last drink and that at four o'clock the end of the evening essentially from an alcoholic beverage perspective uh, will be complete. Um, following 4 a.m. Uh, that's when we'll start clearing the floor and again that large team of, uh, of individuals will move through the sections uh, allowing guests a reasonable amount of time to finish their beverage but essentially four o'clock is our goal to start removing drinks from the area, and at that point, continuing non-alcoholic beverage service, um, which we will continue through the evening. So a guest can continue to sit, they can continue to enjoy the facility. At that point, they'll be switched into coffee, uh, juice, or, or other uh, non-alcoholic beverages. Okay. 
and I'm assuming the, the the policy for active gaming also extends to your private gaming rooms and service in those private Very much salons so. as well. Yes, yes, and we um, we uh, have even discussed um, during that period of time um, after 4 a.m. Uh, we may even be bringing coffee carts onto the uh, casino for non-alcoholic beverages and really making sure that the guests can still enjoy the evening, uh, but have access to non-alcoholic beverages. Actually, uh, much easier than it is to get. Uh, to get alcoholic beverages uh, during the rest of the day. And the, the service bars are actually manned by a physical bartender, it's not a Yes, we didn't do the, that's drink. correct. So um, we, we have a couple of differences from the MGM property. We don't have any non-alcoholic beverage stations on the casino floor. So everything happens from uh, casino service bars and a physical bartender um, pours all the drinks. So um, service, uh, cocktail servers go back to those service bars. There are six on the main floor two upstairs, one in the high limit area, and one in the poker room, so eight total. And all of those are manned by a physical bartender. Um, the drink orders are verbalized from the cocktail server to the bartender. Uh, the bartender acknowledges those drinks in the system, and then those drinks are poured by the bartender, given to the uh, cocktail server, and then returned to the gaming floor. So uh, it's actually a more traditional uh, format of receiving a drink than a self-service unit where they serve themselves are putting in the orders. Yeah, I, I, I just I, I find that commendable. I like the from the security aspect mm -hmm. of it, having somebody physically back there. there. There's a control point, and it also allows us to to make sure that certain uh, internal policies, again, like the service of shots, the service of doubles, none of those things is actually happening because when someone walks up to uh, a machine, again, that's the only control point is themselves. Um, the bartenders are trained 100%, no doubles, no shots, none of those things need to flow. To revisit the issue, because it is of great concern to um, those who've provided comments to us, this whole concept of leaving an establishment at 2 o'clock and going to the casino to try to continue the evening drinking. Um, and from what I'm hearing, with your experience, that um, you know this active gaming, it, it, that's something that someone has to be willing to do or wanting to do um, and you're not seeing as much of those of that shifting from one location off the casino property onto the property for drinking is that what I'm what I'm not uh, director ban has great experience with this and, <laughs> and to the drinking or the after <laughs> two o'clock <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I we, we did see it initially, but then after people started to learn that you had to be actively gaming, that really dropped off. Same thing, Detective Lieutenant? Yes, obviously the facility, that's a 24-hour facility, you're still going to draw crowds that late mm -hmm. night. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to be of the mm -hmm. mindset that people are not going to come at that 2 a.m. hour to the facility. Mm -hmm. But I think it's messaging on the front end, and I think they'll get the message similar to what they at, at MGM that you need to be actively gaming, which may curtail some of the uh, some of that people coming there just for that late night destination and that oasis uh, you know, for, for that last call type of thing. Um, that you know, they, they have to they have to be actively gaming. Uh, so it's something that we'll closely monitor uh, right from day one uh, to see how that works with this facility. You know, with the experience that we've had at MGM, uh, two different different styles of, of the facility, but we'll continually aggressively monitor it and, uh, mm -hmm. and address any issues that we need to. Could you just uh, explain the parking options? I know that you mentioned the valet, um, <laughs> that there's a, a point of intervention there. If I were attending, I started my evening at 5 p.m., might I park elsewhere? We do have self parking. Uh, in the, you say that we do have self parking, yes. so the garage is located directly below the building, and, and we offer uh, self parking there as well. Uh, there, regardless of whether we see somebody, whether officers see somebody walking through uh, into the garage area, or whether they're going to the valet, there are points of interception at all those locations. Right, and the only parking option is for your patrons would be in the, the garage. There's parking in the garage. The city of Everett is also going to be operating a municipal lot across the street. Um, and so patrons could theoretically park. They, they could also be in the lot across the street. Right. And that's about how long of a walk? Uh, 
depends on how quickly you walk, but it's a, about a ten, uh, five to ten minutes. Five to ten minutes. In terms of security, uh, or the safety of, of your patrons go, leaving the entity that would be going to that lot, will it be um, any kind of public safety folks or private Absolutely. Safety? So we'll have our own security team closely monitor that whole, it's, it's part of our driveway and part of our uh, landscaping. So our security team will be on bicycles, they'll be constantly monitoring uh, that area. Um, there's also, as I said earlier, we, we've uh, spoken to Chief Maisie, who's the uh, police chief in Everett, and he's going to be monitoring that area as well. So in other words, there are further points of interception should somebody be having trouble um, visibly if they were missed as they were exiting the entity. Um, and when I say trouble, meaning that maybe their um, level of intoxication somehow had been missed when they were exiting the immediate facility. Uh, and also for other patrons, there's additional security right. so that they will be, their security be safe. And, and we also have our surveillance team, so that's all monitored through surveillance, um, which the GEU has access to, and uh, it's closely monitored. And of course, that includes the garage space as well. Yes. So your surveillance team is trained to notify um, the gaming enforcement unit members if, in fact, they see someone who's really um, struggling, uh, whether it be walking um, or other behaviors that may indicate intoxication. They really know there's a patron here you should take a look at. Absolutely. Commissioners, do you have any questions for the jointly responsible? Parties? Uh, them Commissioner Stevens? I don't have a question, but I don't know if they want to take an opportunity to say anything about their operations or add any if, comments. If you have the, the opportunity to introduce yourselves, we would appreciate that and appreciate that you've come today. And if you would wish to make a comment, I, I guess we don't have we don't have uh, microphones for them. But thank you. If the, that would be. Yeah, I, I think um, very different than how you've operated in other locations um, where you may have uh, an incident that may, um, that may have the local police come and um, there's an incident with a, with a patron and or ABCC may come occasionally and, and make sure you're operating properly. I just think this is very different and, and um, I guess it's important for us to know that you realize that, that this will be closely monitored and this is something um, that, that we take very seriously. So I just think it's very different than how you operate now. I'm not in any way saying that you don't uh, handle intoxicated uh, patients, uh, uh, patrons appropriately, but I think you're hearing what our concerns are and, and how closely we'll be monitoring this. Thank you. Thank you. I'll ask individually, Commissioner Stebbins, do you have further questions for? 
Uh, no what further questions other than I think I referred to it as serve safe. It's actually the TIPS training, which is the alcohol training. So my own personal correction. Oh, oh, thank you. Commissioner Zuniga. Uh, no, no questions. Just to comment that I'm, uh, I'm inclined to approve the, the request as it was uh, presented here. Um, similarly, as I was in favor of the MGM uh, request when it came before us, um, I'm, I'm not sure that you were here, um, Chair, um, but um, uh, the, the, the provisio in all of these, the caveat is that we are closely uh, looking at the procedures. We have a lot of uh, people uh, double teaming on uh, surveillance, security, gaming agents, and the state police um, to look at how uh, it's being executed uh, and, uh, uh, and the, the, the obligation and, and natural uh, occurrence that will happen in terms of reporting back to the commission as soon as we, as soon as you think that there may be something that we need to address in terms of controls or execution or um, restrictions if that's the case. So um, I, I, uh, I will be in favor of this uh, with all those um, Comments. Commissioner Cameron, do you have additional questions or comments? Um, I, I don't have additional uh, questions. I, I do believe the team has uh, had, has answered all of those questions. Um, I also voted in favor of this in Springfield. I spent many years in New Jersey and I'm very accustomed to 24-7 uh, um, alcohol service and the additional challenges uh, that presents. And as you all know, I'm very concerned about public safety, but um, with a prepared team and everyone on board really demonstrating to us that they're taking this matter seriously. And of course, um, our, our proof will be in, in uh, we'll have evidence, we'll have, we'll have statistics, we'll know what's going on, and any decision we make um, can be revisited. So I think we're, um, we're taking this very seriously. Um, but I am inclined as well to support this. I do understand the international business. I do understand the need to compete with others, um, other casinos in the region. Uh, but I, I needed to be assured that everyone was taking this really seriously. I know our team does. I've seen them. Um, and I know our other licensees understand our commitment. And I, I believe that this licensee also understands our, um, our concerns. Commissioner O'Brien, do you have additional questions or comments? Uh, I don't have any other questions. I, my comment would be I still have the same reservations that I had when MGM asked for this initially, particularly given the density and the size of this operation. My preference would be to be having this conversation a good six months out from opening. Um, again, the density and the size of this give me pause. Um, and I remain in the same position I was when MGM asked that my position at this point would not be inclined to allow the two to four to see how things go. Um, before we moved on to that. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank the public for its comments. We received really balanced uh, comments that both supported and also did not support uh, this initiative. It's very important to, to me, and I think I can speak in this instance for my fellow commissioners, to all of us to get that public input. We take it seriously. We understand that this is a, a matter of great import that puts um, public safety at really a paramount concern. I'm also very confident that our team will continue to work very closely with you, and we will receive regular reports on anything that's going to keep you or me or the rest of us up at night. And those reports we'd like to hear in very timely fashion because we would hope that we could also be brainstorming for best practices, improved practices, given the challenges that particularly Commissioner O'Brien has mentioned. We don't have public transportation available after a certain hour. There are some limits with respect to, or limitations and challenges with respect to the property you are on water, and that is both beautiful but presents mm -hmm. a challenge. So we take it all very seriously. 
we appreciate the public input and we appreciate the relationship we know we will have with you going forward um, with respect to this matter and of course everything but this does of course present an important um, responsibility on our part one which the law has asked us to to really exercise our discretion on so with that said uh, I believe that you are seeking a vote today. Yes, Madam Chair, we are. And it's my understanding this is not, that this could be, I suppose, a bifurcated vote, but the, the request is in a license that would put forth a request for a time that extends with the conditions that you've raised, which would be between two and four, with respect to complementary uh, service to only those participating actively in gaming. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, I'd move the commission approve the alcohol permit described in the memorandum from our licensing manager dated May 17th and included in this uh, today's meeting packet allowing alcohol service from 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. I think that's the first vote you've asked us to take. Yes. Second. Any further questions? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero. Uh, further, I'd move the commission approve the service of alcohol on the gaming floor between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. as described in the memorandum from the licensing manager, again dated May 17th and included uh, in today's commission packet. Second. Any further questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. 4-1. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Item number six, commissioner's updates. Uh, start with Commissioner Stebbins. Do you have any update? I do. Um, a, a couple of quick things. Two quick things. First of all, I had the opportunity to go over and visit the um, the gaming school that has been operating at uh, Cambridge College over in Charlestown. Uh, I was very impressed. I had a chance to meet the staff. Also, had a chance to meet a number of the students. Um, I think we've all learned that people who are exploring a new career in gaming didn't come from gaming. Had some other job or career in line and then uh, decided to make a change, but they're, they're doing it with an encouraging sense of enthusiasm as to why they want to make the change. What was interesting, uh, the Cambridge College Gaming School, is that uh, they've also set up the room with surveillance cameras, similar to how they would see on the actual gaming floor. And it also gives uh, the the uh, instructors and the students to kind of go back and review things that were happening, you know, from the overhead shot of a security camera. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, their, uh, I think their first graduation is coming up in, on June 1st, and Director Griffin and I have been invited to attend their, uh, uh, their graduation event. Um, I think like some of you, I also had the chance to have attend the, the ICE uh, sports betting conference over at the BCEC. Um, that was interesting, kind of looking at the next wave of gaming, certainly seeing a lot of the sports betting products that are out there. Uh, I also attended the Responsible Gaming um, program the next day uh, that Commissioner Zuniga spoke at. Uh, the big takeaway for me for that was, you know, we've moved from the moniker of problem gambling to the moniker of responsible gambling uh, gaming and now there's a move afoot to even change that to uh, player health, healthy player, uh, which I thought was interesting, kind of moving moving the needle again and uh, and having had a chance to talk with our own director, Vander London, there might be a, a change in his job title in the future, but uh, I thought that was an interesting point that was raised by a number of the participants for lots of different reasons, but that's my update. Commissioner Cameron. Yep, I also had the chance to get out to um, um, ICE and, and attend some of those uh, uh, some of those sessions in order to um, better educate ourselves 
if 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 it is passed here in Massachusetts and if we are selected to be a regulator, I think it's important to prepare. And I know our staff and all of us are doing that, so some of those sessions were informative. I also got a chance to get out to racing uh, out at Plain Ridge um, since our last meeting and um, observe races and talk to our staff, thank our staff. Um, I think they're doing an excellent job, and I think racing, um, standard bred racing, continues to improve every year the quality of the product, and um, so that was nice to get out there and, and do that as well. Uh, thank you. I, uh, just a couple of things. Um, I'll just speak a little bit more to the research day that I, um, that I attended that Commissioner Stebbins referenced. Uh, there was an all-day uh, research presentation from the Sigma Group, the social and economic impact um, group that uh, has been doing this research for us for now uh, six years. Um, there are great uh, um, reports in the works, some preliminary findings that will come before this commission very soon in, in due time once the final report uh, reports uh, are written. Um, that begin to tell us what is going on in, at MGM one year after, after its opening. So there's uh, something to look forward to. There's, um, in this case, it was well attended by uh, some members of the community. So um, it's just another uh, uh, confirmation, another point of confirmation that uh, the community there is very uh, interested uh, in, in what's going on there um, in terms of, of course, positive and potentially negative impacts. Um, there was a, a, a lot of interest relative to real estate values and rents and uh, uh, etc. So more of that to come. Another reminder that it's also good for us to be out there when we, when we can and we clearly will be there tomorrow. Uh, but uh, especially when it comes to presenting research findings uh, is, uh, is also uh, that more uh, important. Um, I uh, attended the, the, the day of training uh, for Game Sense Advisors that Commissioner Stevens also mentioned um, that I was uh, honored to introduce and there's a lot of uh, good energy uh, in that group. Uh, we, were, we were able to bring uh, uh, speakers who are doing a lot of these break ground, break, uh, you know, groundbreaking uh, rather uh, work in terms of defining uh, positive play and the like, and that was all very, uh, very positive. Um, I will be attending a conference next week, so if we have a meeting, uh, as, as it was suggested, I will be participating by, uh, by phone, um, because I will be in Las Vegas in the risk-taking and gambling conference. Uh, that, they, that the UNLV puts together and it happens every three years. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's one conference in which at least three people related to Massachusetts are presenting, our own Mark Van, Van der Linden and um, Tom Land, who works uh, part-time for us relative to some of the research that we, are, uh, that we are doing and some of the work that's happening here with, uh, with the likes of Games and Sports. And before, before we leave, I just want to say thank you to Bob and, and, uh, and Jackie, who uh, despite all of the um, reports that come uh, before us, you continue to do a lot of uh, the work on the ground that is necessary to keep, these, uh, to keep to these dates and to keep to these commitments. Um, I'm sorry there's not many cameras for me to, uh, That's quite all right, to, to, to but capture that, but, uh, but, but I think it's important to acknowledge that um, that uh, the work that you do is, is, is critical. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you today for your, your input. And do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.